I want to welcome you this morning. Thanks for coming back. Excited to start another class on understanding our salvation. We're calling this God's master plan. To better understand salvation, we're going to look for a couple of things, particularly today. I put them at the top of your sheet there. It says, what are we like when we start this process? What, how, how do we start out? Okay. How does God see me? What's his heart toward me? What's God's desire for me and for the body of Christ? What has God done to make his desire possible to come to pass? Those are kind of the overview of what, what we're going to look for today. We want to see the heart of God in what we're, in what we're going to talk about. Because if we understand his heart, we'll better understand the things that are going on, our, on in our lives and we'll react more appropriately. Yes? <clears throat> so to get us started... I'm going to start with a scripture. Listen for God's heart in this, his desire for us. Ephesians 1, 4 through 7. It says, even before he made the world, God loved us and he chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. Does that stretch you? What's holy mean? Like him. Like him. That's good. Spotless, clean. Spotless and clean. Good. That, to make it really simple, holy is to be set apart to him, apart from the world and the ways of the world, to God and his ways, from, from following the world to following God. Is that simple? Yeah? Okay, verse 5. It says, God decided in advance to what? Okay. Adopt us as his own family. Think about adoption. When you have kids naturally, you get what comes out, right? Boy, girl, character, nature. But when somebody adopts a child, you can get to know that child or see that child first and you choose that child, either because of or in spite of who or what they are. Yes? God knew you before he chose you and adopted you knowing who you were. Is that good? I like that. He adopted us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus. That's what he wanted to do. And it gave him great pleasure to adopt you into his family. Yeah? I don't know. There have been times in my life where I'm thinking, God really got a lemon when he got this one. He's probably like, ah, oh, boy. Right? That's not what it says. He knew what he was getting, and it gave him great pleasure. So we praise God for the glorious grace that he's poured out on us who belong to his dear son. He's so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with what? The blood of his son and forgave our sins. That thing's really packed. I wrote some things on there. We're going to do them as declarations. You know what a declaration is? We're going to speak some things into the spirit realm, declaring truth about ourselves according to what God said. Okay? You ready? We're all going to do these together. God loved me and chose, come on, and chose me. He decided to adopt me into his family and to bring me to himself through Jesus. He decided to make me holy without fault in his eyes. He decided all of this before he created the world. God did it because he wanted to. It gave him great pleasure. Because I belong to Jesus, God has poured out his grace on me. I am not a disappointment. I am not a pain. God wants me. God purchased my freedom and forgave my sins. Thank, Thank you, Father, Father God. God. Hallelujah. Amen. Yes? Are those things true? Yes. Keep the word. Are they true about you? They are. Whether you believe them or not, whether you live according to them or not, they're true. The Bible is, is the story of God pursu pursuing, desiring a people for himself. Yes? It, it's... It's him making it possible for a group of people to be his own. 
to know him, to love him, to obey him. <clears throat> so we're going we're gonna to actually start clear back in the Garden of Eden. Okay? We're going to start way back when everything was created, when everything was started. Okay? And we're going to run it clear up to the time that Jesus gave his life for us. And no, we're not going to be here all week. <laughs> we're going to do it really quickly, okay? Uh, I want you to see not just what God did, but why he did it. Think about his heart in doing these things, all right? I want you to see his intentional love, his desire for that relationship with his people. Right? Let's pray. God, we thank you and praise you that it is your desire to have a people for yourself and that you have called each one of us to be part of that group of people, part of that holy nation that you called out for yourself. And God, we just ask that today as we get into your word that you help us to see in our hearts your desire for us, your heart for us, your plan for us, that as we begin to understand that, we begin to see that you work everything together for our good. So, Father, we just come open this morning. We ask you, Holy Spirit, to teach us, correct us, gather us up from where we're at, and take us forward in our relationship with the Father. And we praise you and thank you for what you're going to do. Amen? Amen? All right. Well, let's start back here where God created everything. Okay, clear back at creation. It's in the Garden of Eden. How did he create things? With words. With words? Good. Did, did he compromise on anything? No. He, he, there was nobody bossing over him, right? He did it the way he wanted. He, he made it exactly the way he wanted. He made it perfectly. Yes? He put man, put Adam in the Garden of Eden. He made him perfect. No sin, right? They had relationship. They walked and talked with each other in the cool of the day. That was God's desire for man and for a relationship with man. You see that? He created it. Every time he get done creating something, what did he say? It is good. He created it good. He created it the way he wanted it. That's the plan. Okay, that's where we start. <clears throat> what happened after Adam sinned? What happened to his relationship with God? Got messed up, didn't it? Okay. When Adam sinned, he, he became sinful. He became corrupted. There was no longer that perfect setup that God initially designed and created. Adam got sent out of the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve both, right? Why did he get sent out of the Garden of Eden? Was, was God mad at him? You didn't do what I said. You ate that apple I told you not to. You're out. God wasn't mad at him, but the sin that affected Adam, who he was, was not able to be in the presence of God. So God had to put them out of the garden for their own safety. God's desire, his heart for Adam and Eve didn't change. His desire for a relationship with man didn't change. And we need to see that. But what was the problem? One little three-letter word. Sin. Sin. That's the problem that we have to deal with. And throughout the story of the Bible, you're going to see God dealing with that problem for the purpose of bringing us closer to himself. Okay? Really important. Now, everyone born since Adam was born with that same corruption, was born with that same sin problem. Okay? We're born slaves to sin. We can't help but sin. L listen closely to me. The sin, the sinfulness of the person determined who they were. Their past, what they did, determined who they were. Okay? That changes later, so it's important for us to get that this is how we started. You were sinful, you sinned, that was who you are, that's your identity as a sinful person. Yes? That's where we start. Okay. What can you do to change that? Nada. Okay. Let's look at Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. It says, once you were dead, why? 
because of your what? Disobedience, Disobedience and sins. many sins. Yes? That's why we were dead. You used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers of the unseen world. He's the spirit at work in the hearts of those who what? Refuse to obey God. You with me? Okay. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our what? Sinful. Our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subjects to God's anger just like everyone else. Our nature was sinful. That's who we were. And it caused us to live in a way that's completely disobedient to God. Self-serving, not God-serving. Yes? That's, that's our starting point. That's where we all start out. It's our default setting, corrupt, sinful, and condemned. Rebellious toward God. And because of that, we're guilty and judged by the law. Okay? Condemned by the law. I know that only partly makes sense, but we're going to run that out. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is what? Death. In other words, the penalty for having sinned is that you owe your eternal life. The wages of sin, the penalty of sin, the cost of sin is death. Okay? Now, apart from Jesus, we'll spend our whole life here on this, on this earth under the control of a merciless slave master, Satan. Okay? And then at the end of this life, we'll spend all of eternity separated from God. Because of what? Three-letter word. Sin. And its penalty. Okay? We need to understand this. We'll be hopelessly trapped in our guilt, in our shame, in our pain. There's no forgiveness. There's no freedom. Nothing. Okay? We're on our own. Now, think about that. Left to ourselves, we've got a life that will never experience the presence of God, the power of God, the love of God, an eternity filled with unimaginable torment separated from God. And you say, man, that's heavy, that's dark. Why are you? We need to understand our great need before we can understand and appreciate his great provision. Okay? If we never see the depth of our need, we'll never see the depth of his provision and the necessity of his provision for us. So that's where we start. Yes? All right. Let's start out with, with the first of our illustration here. What are three sins that are common? Okay, lying, that's a good one. Stealing. Stealing. Can nobody think of any but Wendy? Lust. Lust. Okay, let's do that one. I, I was pretty sure that Wendy wasn't the only one. <laughs> All right, so we'll start out, we, we did stealing first, we'll start out with that. And, and these jars illustrate three ways that we try to deal with our sin. And that scripture talks about us dealing with our sin. And the first one is trying to deal with it ourselves. Trying to live better. Trying to do right. Not sin anymore. So we're going to take our sin and put it into this jar. And we can work as hard as we want to. Trying to deal with that sin. Trying to wash that off of there. Trying to get it to go away. And you can come back in a week and it'll still be there. You can come back in a year and it'll still be there. Our efforts do nothing to deal with our sin. Okay? And that's where we start. So we'll set him down there until we get to the next one. All right, back to our timeline. After Adam, okay, after his time, people live for... Nine generations without the presence of God. Think about that. They got thrown out of the garden out of the presence of God. They lived for nine generations without godly influence, without correction or direction. 
And by that time, they got so corrupt that God had to destroy them all and start over. Look at the scripture, Genesis 6, 5. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was so great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart, every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Look at the words they use. Man became so corrupt that there was no turning back. And that same godlessness that we see take, that took over back then is trying to take over now. It's no different. It's the same enemy. Okay? The New Testament tells us that uh, at the time of Jesus' return, that it's going to be like the days of Noah and the days of Lot. What were the days of Noah like? Lawlessness. Complete living for self. Complete disregard for God. It says right there that every intent of the thoughts of their heart were only evil continually. That's what Scripture says it's going to be like when Jesus returns. That doesn't sound like any fun, does it? But remember, God's heart's for us in all of this. He's looking for a people for himself. He created us for a relationship with himself. Yes? Keep that in mind. He wants us to know him. He wants us to live in his presence. He wants us to be in that intimate fellowship. Yes? What's the obstacle that's keeping us from it? Three letters. Sin. Sin. Okay? And we can't do anything with it by ourselves. Now, in his desire to have a people for himself, and I'm moving on in my timeline here, God picked the only righteous person that was left, that was Noah, and he had him build what? An ark. An ark's just a great big boat. And through that ark, Noah and his family were saved, and they took enough animals with them to repopulate the earth after the destruction. Yes? Yes. Okay. Now, about ten generations after Noah, after God started over again, God started a plan to get a people for himself. And he started with a guy named Abram. Okay? He later became Abraham. He made a covenant. He made an agreement with him to make a, a whole nation out of his descendants. Okay? This was God's start. This was God's initiation to, to, to have that nation for himself. About two more generations, it was Abraham, Isaac, and anybody know who the next one is? Jacob. Okay? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. <clears throat> a guy named Joseph, Jacob's son, became a very powerful leader in Egypt. He, he actually brought his whole family into Egypt, and they had incredible favor with the Egyptians. There was, it, was a plenty, it was the most powerful nation in the world at the time. And Joseph, was Joseph an Israelite, was second in command, and he brought his whole family there, and they, they prospered. For like 400 years, they were there. But toward the end of that time when they were there, they got so big, so, so plentiful, that the Egyptians got afraid of them, thinking if they banded together, they could take them over. So they started oppressing them, put them into slavery, started making them work as slaves. Okay? And they cried out to God. And by the end of that time, a guy named Moses got called out to lead the Israelites out of Egypt, out of captivity. Okay? Listen for God's heart in Exodus 6.6. 6. It says, Therefore say to the children of Israel, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will rescue you from their bondage. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. I will take you as my people, and I will be your God. Then you'll know that I am the Lord your God, who brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will bring you into the land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I will give to you as a her give it to you as a heritage. I am the Lord. Do, do you hear? the personal relationship desire between God and the Israelites. I will do this for you. I will come and get you. I will redeem you. I will save you. I will make you my own people. I'll be your God and you'll be my people. Hear the heart of the Father in that as, as he was beginning to build this people for his relationship. And we're, we're going to see later that this picture of Israel being taken out of Egypt is actually a picture of 
you know, Moses took Israel out of Egypt as of Jesus taking God's people out of the world. Okay? So this, this picture of God's heart toward the people, it's, it's for Israel, but it's for us too. Yeah? And I'll show that to you later. Moses eventually took the Israelites out of Egypt, took them into the desert, through the Red Sea. You remember that story? Exodus 19.1. It says, In the third month after the children of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on the same day they came to the wilderness of Sinai. Then you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you, I carried you on eagles' wings, and brought you where? To myself. myself. He didn't just take them into the desert. He didn't just take them out of bondage. He brought them to himself. Hear the heart in that. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my commandment, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. Again, hear God's desire to have his own. Yeah? And notice that obedience is really important. If you will obey my commandments, then you'll be a special people. Is it because we need to earn his love? Absolutely not. It's because if we are obedient, we don't what? Sin. Sin. What is it that separates us from God? What separated Adam from God? Sin. Sin. And the penalty of it. Yes? God, if God wants us to walk in obedience because it keeps us closer in relationship to him. And, and when we take that and say, that, well, God's just a, a boss and he just wants me to do what's right. And if I don't do what's right, he's going to slap me down and step on me like a bug. That's not the heart of God. God's heart is for us to walk in obedience to him so that we can be in relationship with him. Yeah? All right. God brought Israel out of Egypt to relate to them. He revealed to himself to them from a distance. He, he was in their midst. Not, not like with Adam. With Adam, he walked with them and talked to them the cool of the day, face to face. That was the perfect. That's the ideal. That's what he wants. But in this situation... <coughs> Excuse me. He wasn't able to do that, but he began to build an opportunity for them to walk close to him and proximity to him. Okay? But the, what has to be dealt with for that to happen? The sin problem, right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to keep bringing you back to that because that's, that's the problem. In order to deal with the sin problem, God set up an, uh, uh, animal sacrifices. Okay? A whole bunch of rules and regulations. But it, it, it was animal sacrifices to cover up their sin. To deal with the sin problem so that they could be near to him. Actually, um, that he could be among them is what it said. Hebrews 9.22 says, According to the law, almost all things are purified with what? Blood. And without the shedding of blood, there's no what? Remission. Remission is taking away. Okay. Without blood being shed, there's no forgiveness, there's no freedom. <clears throat> there's no breaking of the power of sin over our lives. Even in the Garden of Eden, what, what happened when Adam and Eve sinned and realized they were naked? What did they do? Covered up with what? Leaves. They put fig leaves on, right? But when God showed up, what did he do? He killed an animal. He shed blood and covered them with the skin. Yeah? I think that's a picture of that shedding of blood to deal with. All right. God had Israel build a temple, a tabernacle. And, and, and look, just for the purpose of, of illustration, there were two rooms in that tabernacle. The first room was the holy place where the priests went into every day and ministered to God. They, they did a whole bunch of ritual things, but they went in and ministered to God. And then there was a big veil, a heavy veil that separated. And then there was a second room over here where the, the Ark of the Covenant was. Okay? The Ark of the Covenant is the place where God's presence dwelt. Okay? The presence of God was behind that veil. And almost nobody could go in there. One time a year, one person was allowed to go in. Let's read this. Hebrews 6, 9. Or 9, 6, I'm sorry. 
when these things, this, this tabernacle thing was all in place, the priests rarely entered the first room as they performed their religious duties. But only the high priest ever entered the most holy place and only once a year, and he always offered blood for his own sins and for the sins of the people who had committed in ignorance. <clears throat> by these regulations, the Holy Spirit revealed, listen to this, by these regulations, the Holy Spirit revealed that the entrance into the most holy place, into the Holy of Holies, was not freely open as long as the tabernacle and the system that represented were, were in use. As long as the only thing that they had to deal with their sin was the blood of animals, people couldn't go where? Into the most holy place. Past the veil, into the most holy place, into what? Close to God. God's, God's presence. presence. The, the blood of animals was not enough to make us clean enough to get into the presence of God. What does God want from way back in the Garden of Eden? He wants us in his presence. Yes? That's the plan. That's what he's shooting to get established again. <clears throat> Verse 9. This illustration pointing to the present time. For the gifts and sacrifices that the priests offer are not able to cleanse the consciences of the people who bring them. For that old system deals only with food and drink and various kinds of, cl kinds of cleansing ceremonies. Physical re resolution... <laughs> regulations that were in effect only until a better system could be established. So God has a better plan coming. And, and this whole animal thing is a stopgap. It's an in-between thing. It's a not really that good, but it's better than nothing kind of thing. Yes? So that we, the, the people could be in the same vicinity as God. Now, Exodus 25, 8 says, Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell where? among them not in them or directly with them but among them so god set up this tabernacle in the middle of the camp of the israelites and he lived among them but not in that relationship that face-to-face -face relationship in his presence yeah <clears throat> so here's why the blood of animals couldn't cleanse sin we're going to take our our lying sin and put it in our jar okay so the blood of animals was the second way that the Bible talks about dealing with sin well what's the problem it's still there, it's still there isn't it now, if you could flatten that paper out you could still read it you can still see the sin but what the blood of animals did was cover up sin so while us trying to deal with our own sin did nothing, at least the blood of animals covered it up so that they could be in the vicinity of God and that God could live in the, amongst them. Yes? Again, we're talking about God's plan from the beginning of time through all the Bible. He's, he's building a way for his people to have a relationship with him. All right. Why all this stuff about blood? For the most part, blood's kind of nasty. It's like makes people sick, that kind of thing. So why does the Bible talk about blood so much? I'm going to show you. What do we say the wages of sin was? Yeah. Death. Okay? We owe our eternal life. We're all born under the law. We're all going to be judged by it. That's how we start. We talked about that. Exodus 21, verse 23 says, Under the law, this is how the law works, you shall give what? Life, life for life, life, eye for eye, eye tooth for tooth, tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. So whatever somebody does wrong, that's what is extracted for them from them in payment to satisfy the law. So if you two get in a scrap and Wendy knocks your teeth out, what's the law going to say to bring justice? They're going to knock hers out. Same ones. Right? If, if, if you cut a big gash above her eye, the law says you get a big gash. Now justice is satisfied. Yes? That's the law. 
eye for eye, tooth for tooth, life for life. Okay, that's important. Now, you say, well, that's, that's nasty. <laughs> I thought God loved us. He was a God of love. Well, God is love, but he's also an all-consuming fire. And there's a justice side of God that, that has to be satisfied. It must be. That's who he is. If he didn't satisfy justice, he would cease to exist because that's who he is. Yes? As much as he's love, he's just. Now, <clears throat> think about this. The holiness of God, think about it like a, 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 the most bright, pure, intense light imaginable. And then take a, a box full of darkness. And you open that box into that presence of that intense light. What's going to happen to the darkness? The, the darkness isn't going to overcome the light, is it? That light is just going to obliterate the darkness. And that holiness of God to our sinfulness is kind of, it's kind of a comparison. If our sinfulness came into the presence of, of the pure holiness of God, it would be destroyed. And remember I said that's who we are. That's our identity. That sinfulness, that corruption. So we would be destroyed. And that's not what God wants. So we couldn't come into his presence. Does that make sense? Yeah? You with me? Okay. Well, I want to make sure I bring you along in this because it's crazy important. It, 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 we see God's heart in this. That's why he doesn't, that's why he kicked Adam out of the Garden of Eden. Right? That's why being in his presence in the Holy of Holies wasn't possible. Because it wasn't, it wouldn't be good for us. Yeah? Now, our sinfulness, sinfulness mean, means that we owe our eternal spiritual life under the law. What was the rule about? Justice. If I owe my life, what's the only way to not lose my life? An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a what? A life for a life. A life for a life. It would take another life to pay for my life to, to listen, to redeem that from the penalty of the law, to buy that back from the penalty of the law, yes? So it would take a life to buy my life back. That's the only way I could be saved, or any one of us, because we owe because of our sinfulness. Now, I don't know if you have kids, but I'm sure any one of you would lay down your life for your kids. If it was, if, if your child was on trial and, and to be executed and the only way they could be saved was for you to give your life for their life, you would do it, right? But what's the problem in the, in the realm of the spirit with giving our life for somebody else's? You don't own it. You owe your life already, don't you? Each and every one of us has sinned and we all owe, owe our life. So I couldn't give my life for my wife's because I don't own it. It's forfeit, yes? Do you see that? Nobody can do that. You see where I'm going with this? And <laughs> you've heard people say, well, a God of love would never send good people to hell. Well, that's true, but that's not God's problem. God's problem isn't not sending good people to hell because there aren't any good people. We're all what? Sinful and corrupt. God's problem is, how do I not send people to hell that deserve it and still remain just? Do you see that? As we all deserve it, but God's desire is to save us. But he has to be just. So how do we do that? 2 Corinthians 5.21 God made Jesus who knew no what sin to be sin for us that we might become what? The righteousness of God in Christ. Through this transaction in Jesus we become what? Read that. We become the righteousness of Christ in the transaction that happens through the cross. We become righteousness. That's wild. Okay? 
Jesus is the only one. Why can Jesus make this trade of his life for ours? He's the only one who never what? Sin. Sinned. He's the only person who never sinned. So he didn't what? Owe his own life. And he could do what? Give it. Give it in place of ours. Do you see? Light bulbs come on. This is awesome. God's pretty sharp. Mm -hmm. So why did Jesus have to die? Why is Jesus the only way to the Father? Because he's the only one who didn't owe his life. He's the only one that was sinless and was able to give his life as a ransom for ours. Yes? I heard all that stuff for years and years in Sunday school and church. No idea what it meant. This is what it means. And if we understand our salvation, we begin to understand the heart of God and what Jesus did on the cross. And it'll totally change the way we walk in this life. If we get this. Yeah? Understand our salvation. All right. How did Jesus give his life to redeem ours? 1 Peter 1.18. It says, You were not redeemed with corruptible things like gold or silver from your aimless con conduct received by the tradition of your fathers. But you were redeemed, you were brought back with the precious what? Blood. blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So our debt is paid with what? The blood of Jesus. Yeah? Get this, this is so important. Get this next scripture. Leviticus 17, 11. For the life of the flesh is where? In the blood. In the blood. The life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. This is from the Old Testament. For it is the blood by reason of what? Life that makes atonement. Okay? The life of the body is in the blood. That word is translated to life is nephesh. It means soul. So the soul of the flesh is in the blood. Your soul is in your blood. Your life is in your blood. Okay? He said, I've given you the blood, the soul, the life of animals on the altar to make atonement for you. What's atonement? It's, it's really easy. Break it up. At one meant. It brings us to be one with God. What's, what's the goal the whole way from the Garden of Eden? For us to be what? In relationship. In relationship to what? For us to be one with the Father. This atonement, this at one meant is done through the blood. How's it done through the blood? It satisfies the law. It's a what? A life for a life. Yes? A life's required payment. The blood is required when the life is required. I don't know whether you're running ahead of me yet, but think about the cross. Yeah? It's the blood, the life of Jesus, that was willingly poured out on the cross for our sins. It's the only thing that can bring complete cleansing for our sins from our sins, from the, from the penalty of our sins, okay? The spirit man gets made pure and holy, and the spirit man is the one that, that needs to be able to have a relationship with the Father, okay? We're, we're running this down. We're just about done with this. Now, Hebrews 9, 13. It says, under the old system, in other words, under the, the animal sacrifice thing, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a young cow, animal sacrifices, could cleanse people's bodies from ceremonial impurity. Just think how much more the blood of Christ will purify our consciences from sinful deeds so that we can do what? Worship. Worship the living God. When we get cleansed in this complete way, it brings us into a place where we can worship the living God. God wants us to worship in spirit and in truth. It's an intimate worship. It's not just stand there and sing a song. It's entering into his presence. Yes? That's what he's been after. Now, let's look at this third jar. What do you suppose the third jar illustrates? The blood of Jesus. This is God's provision. So we take our third one, it's lust, and we drop that in. And with the blood of Jesus, no. 
what happens to our sin? Disappears. Can you read that paper? Yeah. You can't even find that paper. The blood of Jesus does the job. Only the blood of Jesus does the job. Makes a hair stand up in the back of my neck every time I do it. <laughs> The three ways that we try to deal with sin on our own and it's still in there and you can still read it if you got it close enough the animal sacrifices that cover sin sin's still there yeah but the blood of Jesus it's gone Hebrews 7:24. But Jesus, because, because he continues forever as an unchangeable priesthood, therefore he, he is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, completely to the uttermost, without anything left. Hebrews 7.19, For the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is a bring of a better hope, Jesus' sacrifice, through which we what? Draw near, to God. Draw near to God. What's he been trying to do all along? Have a relationship. Draw us near into fellowship, into intimacy, and into relationship with him. Do you remember the veil between the holy place and the most holy place? It separated where people came every day from what? In the presence of God. Remember that scripture that said as long as the animal sacrifice thing is still in place, as long as that's as good as you can do, you can't get through the veil. Because if you went into his presence, you'd get poofed. The box of darkness and the, the holy light, yes? <clears throat> now, look what happened when Jesus died on the cross. Matthew 27, verse 50. Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Then, watch, behold, the veil of the temple was what? Torn, into Torn in two how? Top to From top. This wasn't a, a, a blanket off your bed. This was a veil. I can't remember how many 20 feet high or whatever. It was heavy. It was thick. When Jesus had given all his blood, when Jesus had paid the full price for our debt, when he had given his life for our life, the first thing that God did was reach down from heaven, took that sucker and ripped it open and said, now, finally, the way into my presence is open for my people. Their sin is dealt with. They can come into my presence. This is what I've been after. This is what started the whole way back when sin happened in the Garden of Eden. The whole way through all those things that happened in the Bible, clear up to the time of Christ. Jesus was born to be a sacrifice for our sins. He willingly gave his life for our life, a sacrifice for our sins. He paid our debt. He redeemed us. He bought us back with his own blood, with his own life. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. Amen. If you can understand the heart of the Father and doing all that for us, making all that available to us, it'll so change the way that you walk with him. We'll stop seeing him like the big cop in the sky that's ready to squash us like a bug when we goof. And instead, we see the provision that he made to bring us into fellowship and into intimacy with him and keep us there. It's still important that we walk in obedience. It's still important that we deal with sin. You know, it says if we sin, we have an intercessor. We have a way to deal with it. And we take it. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We've got a place to go with our sin, with our pain, with our shame, with our guilt. And get it dealt with. And be established in that relationship that we can go into his presence. Yes? Wow. Wow. That's Hebrews 10, 19 says, So dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter most, heaven's most holy place. We can go where? Into, his into the most holy place, into his presence. Brothers and sisters, 
By his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go where? Right into the... What's it say? Let's go right into the presence of God. With sincere hearts, fully trusting him. Why do we fully trust him? Because we have to believe that the blood of Christ has cleansed our sins. And by faith, we are saved. By faith, we are healed. By faith, we are set free. We can go in fully trusting. Yes? For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean. And our bodies have been washed with pure water. Talk about eternal life. Listen to the Bible's description of eternal life, John 17, 3. This is eternal life, that they may what? Know you. There's an intimacy to that knowing, okay? That they may know you, God, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Knowing God and knowing Jesus defines eternal life. And we can only know them as we go through the veil. Yes. Questions? Thoughts? I was thinking a picture when you were going through about God's part. Uh, uh, it started in heaven that he was talking to Israel and then he took one step closer to the tabernacle so he got closer to the people mm -hmm. but it still wasn't enough because he couldn't get there. So he still went one step further then. So then my next thought was the heart. He wanted to go to the heart then so that he could dwell in us then too. And it actually says that he will take out our heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh. He do a transformation in us. And that happens through this. Good. I like to hear that revelation. Stuff God's showing you. Share that. What else are you seeing? I think my eyes just got totally opened anew. I never, I, I've been in this walk for 16 years and I have never imagined or understood it the way you just made it come to life. But I didn't, the Holy Spirit did Exactly. It. I, I, I received that. Exactly. But that's revelation and yes. that's what we're after. Yes. And that's what I got when I went to study in this. I kept going, oh, that is so good. God, I never saw that. And the pieces begin to fit together. Remember me talking mm -hmm. about it? It's happening for you. The pieces that you've gained over the years are fitting together and making everything make sense. Yeah. I'm close to tears and I don't cry. It's good. That's the Holy Spirit working in you. Let him sink that stuff deep. Well, even the law system makes sense now, too, because we're <clears throat> talking about the holiness. And if you have the darkness, the holiness would just, the light would just disperse the darkness. Yeah, yeah. So if, when God made up that law system, it actually showed that this is what you have to do in order to be perfect. Mm -hmm. And, and no can't. matter who tried it, they were never going to be perfect. That's this one. So it just made sense that God just showed it in that way. Just showed like, okay, I can show you that you can try to be perfect, but you mm -hmm. can't. And we can't. We started out talking about our lostness and our depth of our need and our complete inability to do anything about it. That's it. And that's where a lot of people are at because they think that they can just do it. They can be perfect on their own. Think if I do more good things than bad yeah, things, I'll be well. okay. Yeah. Guess where you are. And guess what the condition of your sin is. It's still all applied to your life. Because you're still under the law. Why do we owe our lives to Jesus? He saved us. Because this is where we were, and we were nothing. We were doomed. And now, we have the righteousness of Christ. That's a mind blow. Now the problem is we need to live that way. Stop living like this and start living like this. But that's another part of our salvation.
which we will talk about. Questions? Other thoughts? Good stuff. Thanks for sharing. Nothing? Okay, let's pray. Father, we praise you and thank you for your love for us, for your incredible provision for, for us through your Son, through Jesus, through his blood, his life for our life, to bring us into relationship with you. God, forgive us for ignoring this great salvation. Forgive us for not coming into your presence. Forgive us for taking so lightly what you have done so amazingly. Holy Spirit, we ask you to give us more and more revelation of the reality of what you have done for us to draw us to yourself, to make us able to go through the, through the torn veil and into your presence. And God, as we come into your presence, we thank you that you will transform us into your image from one level of glory to another. You'll make us more and more like Jesus. Holy Spirit, lead us into all truth. Lead us into that relationship that transforms us into your image. Thank you, Jesus, for the cross.